But anyway, I wanted to present Drant to you. Drant's a, a master gardener. If you got any garden gardening questions, he's the man. But he also is, a, I guess, a local historian. He has a passion for the upstate. Uh, he's done a lot of work. He's been leading field trips. So uh, if you have any questions, he can answer them. And he's the man. Thank you, Drant. Okay, well, thank you. I hope everybody can't hear me. No, you can't hear me? Well, I can speak real loud, and I don't... Uh, can y'all hear okay? Um, one thing I will ask, if everybody would please turn their cell phones off or put them on mute, I appreciate that. And um, if... I like to answer questions. But if you don't mind waiting till the end, we'll have a question and answer period. Many times somebody asks a question, which is the next sentence I'm only answering. That. And my train of thought, I actually do have a train of thought, but it's feeble at times. So appreciate if y'all can help me out with that day. Um, we are being videotaped tonight uh, with Tom Hawkins and the Backcountry Diggers. Um, we work together on some projects. They're um, metal detecting experts, and they work on some of the sites and so forth that uh, I work on as well. Um, my name is Duran Ashmore. I've um, been here in this area for um, 40 years, but I'm seventh generation Greenville County. Uh, my family's been here ever since 1787. And uh, I do have um, uh, Revolutionary War uh, ancestors on both sides. And uh, following their history, you know, really got me interested in the um, uh, history of the Revolutionary War. And, you know, the question that was always burning in my mind was, why did these people do what they did at this time? And what all of the settlers who were here in the back country, what they did was truly phenomenal. Um, these were some incredible people. Now what we're gonna be talking about today primarily is um, what led up to the um, conflicts in the Revolutionary War. And um, this is somewhat of what I talked about the last time, and uh, I know a lot of you folks were here the last time I talked a few months ago, and there will be some repetition, but I'm going to be going into much more detail about, um, you know, why our ancestors, why the people in this very spot here uh, felt it necessary to take up arms and fight for their freedom or against their freedom, because... Um, the populace here in the back country was totally divided. The activity in the Revolutionary War in the back country of South Carolina was truly a civil war. It was neighbor against neighbor. Many times it was father against son. We talked about that in the war between the states. That was the second civil war. The American Revolution, particularly here in the back country, was um, um, a, a civil war. Now, one thing I do want to begin with is talking about some of the terms that were used, some of the governmental uh, processes, the legislative actions that were taking case, uh, place at that time. I got into this because I love um, military history. I love to know the battles and so forth, and the tactics that were used. But again, I kept getting back to this question of why? Why were these folks doing this? You know, what led to these, to these actions? Um, and what kept such bitter division with these people who were living back here? Why did they hate each other so much? And in many ways, it was pure hatred that was uh, the motivating factor in, in what went on. Um, you have on one side the loyalist or the king's men, and if they were particularly evil loyalists, then they, they were the Tories. So we had the Tories and the loyalists. That's the term that you're going to hear me using throughout. You'll also hear me using the term patriot. However, patriot 
was never used at all by anybody who ever fought in the Revolutionary War. And it was actually 30 years after the war was over that, that uh, authors started using that term to describe the people who were fighting for independence. And uh, most of the time, these folks were referred to as rebels. And they were also referred to as Whigs. They were frequently referred to as Whigs. They were also referred to as associators because um, the uh, Crown of England wanted to deal with each colony independently um, and not have the colonies here unite and associate together. That way we would be stronger. So uh, early on in the um, uh, time period before shots were being fired, there were efforts to sign oaths of association um, that would, you know, signify that you wanted a unified uh, American presence to deal with what was happening with, you know, the British rule and so forth. But the people who were here pre-Civil, pre-Revolutionary War were true pioneers. This was the edge of civilization right here. Um, this area was referred to as the 96th district. And you can see how the 96th district is outlined here on this map of the different eight districts that were in South Carolina um, uh, pre-Civil War, pre-Revolutionary uh, pre War. Here you can see where the Cherokee territory was defined. Um, Greenville County is right here, Anderson, Pickens, Oconee County, the four westernmost counties of South Carolina were Indian Territory. Most of you cannot see the white lines on this map. The white lines on this map are the current uh, county boundaries. And if you'll notice, there's a little jog right here on Greenville County that um, is not included in the Indian boundary. And that's where we are right now. We are roughly right here on the edge on the border of uh, Cherokee territory. The county line was changed in 1792, um, but in 1776, there was a straight line defining the difference between uh, the 96 territory and the Cherokee land. It's interesting how those um, lines were established in the first place. Um, there was a Cherokee War in 1758, 1761, the first Cherokee War. Uh, that was settled at the Treaty of Augusta um, in 1760. And at that time, the southernmost border of Cherokee land was surveyed and identified. The British government made a proclamation in 1739 that no um, person of European descent could live in Indian territory. And that made the Indians happy, except Indian territory was never defined. There was no way to say this is Indian territory or this is not. So, in 1760, what they did was they took the westernmost point of South Carolina that was surveyed, and that's this point right here. It's a location called DeWitt's Corner. So um, the treaty said that from DeWitt's Corner, there will be a line northeast to the Reedy River, that's this point, and southwest to the Savannah River, that's this point. So this point here was defined, and that was it. And in 1766, the governor of North Carolina, he decided he kind of liked the way this land right here looked. So he drew this line. Lower Tryon of North Carolina drew this line right here, which presently divides Greenville from Spartanburg County. And uh, of course, people in South Carolina protested over that, and there was a court ruling in London. It took six years for that ruling to be finalized, but in London, the court said, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, 
This is South Carolina, and um, you know it, it needs to go to South Carolina. So then this area right here, which uh, Lower Trine claimed, actually became part of officially South Carolina, and it was referred to as the new acquisition. Uh, the history of the property lines is just really interesting, really fascinating, or, or the boundary lines rather, I would say, between the state of South Carolina and North Carolina, and between um, uh, Greenville County and everywhere else, but that's sort of a time for another, another story. But um, with the people who were back here, pioneers, resourceful people, people who could build a house with an axe, uh, that's, you know, how hardworking these, these folks were. Some of them were loyalists to the king. Some of them wanted uh, independence. They did not want to be ruled by the royal governor in Charleston. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a division there. But there was total unanimity with the thought of protection from the Cherokees. That was the overriding concern of these settlers. And many times the decision was made, whether you're a loyalist or a Whig, on who you thought was going to better protect you from the Cherokee depredations. The relationship with the Cherokees was of paramount importance um, to these, these early settlers. I told you briefly about the first Cherokee War of 1758-1761. Uh, uh, this is kind of an offshoot of the French and Indian War that started in 1754. But, um, you know, there was the Long Canes Massacre um, where John C. Calhoun's grandmother and 23 others were fleeing to Augusta, but they got stuck in the mud and uh, the Indians overtook them and, and killed them. That was just one of several incidents at that time. The British, they were concerned about um, the French during this period, so they built a fort right here in, uh, I guess it would have been in Oconee County, um, at uh, Kiwi, which was the primary Cherokee um, uh, capital town of the uh, lower Cherokees. So Kiwi was a main uh, trading center. Uh, the, Cher the British had Fort uh, Prince George there, and um, it was it was a trading center, but it was also a way for the the British to keep the French at bay and also the Cherokees at bay. And uh, the British also uh, built another fort in Tennessee. Fort Loudon, which was 150 miles away from uh, Fort Prince George, and um, that uh, you know was was one of their outposts. Terrible tragedies happened at Fort Prince George. The commander, Lieutenant Coatmore, was murdered. There were 23 hostages of Indian chiefs in Fort Prince George. As soon as Lieutenant Coatmore was, was killed, the hostages were were killed. Um, bad blood, you know, going in there. The fort in Tennessee, Fort Loudon, it was surrounded, it was completely cut off. The garrison there said, um, if we give up our arms, would you let us march out of the fort? The Indians said, sure, go ahead. And um, so, you know, a few miles out of the fort, there's one report says that the um, Cherokees found um, guns and ammunition buried in the floor in the floor of the fort, which meant that um, they had violated the terms of the agreement they had made, or they just wanted to kill all those people anyway. So the entire garrison was, was killed, about 150 men. Um, so that's the first Cherokee War. Um, and things were sort of uh, quiet until the Revolutionary War when things heated up a lot. So, the, in the colony of South Carolina, there were two classes of people. It was a, a class society. There were the aristocrats along the coast. There's no doubt about it. You know, the, the aristocrats thought very differently from all of the backcountry. 
They had their own interest. They were slave traders. Um, they were slave owners. They were rice planters. And they were affected by British policies, uh, taxes, and so forth. So uh, they chafed under this um, policy and the plan that the British had. But the back country, what they were worried about was the Indians. Who can protect them most from the Indians? Can the British protect? After the first um, <clears throat> Cherokee War, there were no British soldiers in South Carolina. There were none. They, they took them all out. It was left up to the local militias to protect themselves from Cherokee depredations. And militias became, you know, a, actually anybody over 18 had to be part of the militia. And these militias would meet at the home of a, um, you know, wealthy landowner uh, who would, you know, have drill practices and that sort of thing. And everybody would come as long as there was plenty of beer or whiskey available. You know, this was a big, big part of it. This was the attraction. You get away from your wives for a little while, and you ride your horse, you shoot your gun, you drink your, your whiskey. And then you go home. Um, what could go wrong? What could go wrong, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, the leading men of the area had, you know, the militias, and then they would vote whoever had the best whiskey, he'd be elected colonel. Um, and so, you know, they had... One of my lectures is alcohol in the revolution, the role of alcohol in the revolution, and it had a huge role. And we'll talk about that in a little bit in some of these, these instances. But, um, you know, the militias arose, and uh, there, was, there was still no protection, no government coming from um, Charleston. And I've, I've looked at this. I, I have not seen any other than one person that was British who was here in South Carolina. I mean, everybody else was American. The one British person was the governor, William Campbell, and he had absolute authority. He appointed the officials to do whatever functions the officials needed to do. They were all Americans, justices of the peace that were popular. So William Campbell appointed who the justice of the peace were, and they were, you know, his buddies and friends and stuff like that. So if you got appointed justice of the peace, hey, you were off with the clown. You liked that. Um, the people who the justice of the peace were prosecuting and putting in jail, and they didn't like that. So they may want to be relics. Uh, they didn't want that governor and his appointed officials uh, dictating their life. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, that was part of what was going on in, in the back country. But because there was no official um, uh, government in this area, like if you wanted to buy land uh, and have your deed um, uh, certified, you had to go to Charleston to do that and then back, and that's a two week trip. If your neighbor stole your horse, You'd have to go to Charleston, get a warrant. They may send somebody out to arrest your neighbor or not, and we're looking at months down the road. So what are you going to do instead? I mean, you know, you're going to take it out of your neighbor. Um, but it got so bad with so, um, so much lack of law that a uh, group arose called the Regulators. It was a vigilante group. In the 1760s, there was a vigilante group called the Regulators who would go around and people they suspected of uh, horse stealing or something like that, they would, they would get them, they would whip them, they may hang them if they thought they were guilty of murder. Um, they may take them down to Charleston and put them in jail, but they may not. But it got so bad with the Regulators movement, it was such a vigilante group that another group came up in opposition to them, and they were called the moderators. And there was almost a big war between the regulators and the moderators. Um, but they, there were no blows landed, and uh, they settled things down. And that was the time in, um, 
I think it was 1769, that the uh, 96th district was um, established. And 96 was where uh, the seat of justice was. And uh, 96 was on the um, Cherokee trading path from Kiwi through here, through Orangeburg, down to Charleston. Trade with the Indians was lucrative. Uh, you can trade pots and pans for deer skins and medicinal plants, and the Europeans always came out ahead on that deal. But um, trading for Cherokee uh, deer skins was, was a profitable thing. You could trade hunting knives, whatever you wanted to trade, whiskey, um, you could. So, 96 was the most prosperous spot in the uh, backcountry at that point. They had 12 houses. So that was a big deal. And then, uh, just as a comparison, Charlotte, Charlotte had 20 houses. So Charlotte was almost twice as big. But um, there was the grandest structure in the backcountry in 96. It was so grand that people would come from miles around just to look at it. It was three stories tall and it was made out of brick. It was the jail. <laughs> so that was that was the you know the big thing was the jail at 96. And they would have court like every three months or six months or something like that. And so whoever was um, you know up for trial for horse stealing or whatever, they'd have to stick say in that jail for um, for uh, months on end until that trial came. So, um, you know, just, just a lot of friction at that time. The aristocracy, they wanted to get rid of the royal governor, so they did. But half of the people in the back country were loyal to the royal governor, and the other half, you know, wanted to um, get, get rid of them. So traditionally, um, the uh, uh, British government had been sending a wagon load of shot and powder up to the Cherokees every year so that they could shoot more deer and provide more deer skins. The Cherokees depended on that shot and powder for their livelihood. Well, when the governor got run into Charleston Harbor, the um, uh, government that took over which is the provincial government. At that time, South Carolina called themselves a province. So it's the provincial government um, replaced the royal government at that time. And the provincial government formed what they call a council of safety. This was a group of about five or six men who really made all the decisions. It was martial law. Um, the Council of Safety had the power of dictators. What they said went. The president of, or the chairman of the Council of Safety was Henry Lawrence. That's Lawrence County is named after him. Henry Lawrence never set foot in Lawrence County, but they did name the county after him. <laughs> Henry Lawrence was the largest tr uh, slave trader in America at that time. Through, he owned the company that was selling slaves, you know, in the port of Charleston. So um, he was in charge of the Council of Safety. And um, they decided that they needed to send the shot and the powder to the Cherokees so that, um, uh, you know, the Cherokees would be on the Patriot or Whig side. And I will use the term Patriot quite a bit because everybody can kind of figure out who I'm talking about for sure. Sometimes the term Whigs gets lost. Whigs and Tories were two political parties in England. And a lot of the conflicts that were happening in England came over here, and that was another reason people, you know, fought against each other. Um, but uh, the Council of Safety sent the wagon train of shot and powder trying to get to Kiowee and placate the Cherokees and get the Cherokees on their side. 
Well, the loyalists who were in this area at that time, they were concerned about that. So they captured the wagon train uh, 18 miles below 96 at a place called 96. I mean, in a place called Mine Creek. This was Patrick Cunningham. Patrick Cunningham came from a very influential uh, um, family in the Long Canes community. And the Long Canes community was right in here. He was called Long Canes because the river cane grew so tall that the settlers knew that it was fertile ground. Everywhere that river cane grew, river canes in the grass family, every place where that river cane grew, corn grew. And um, so corn was the primary crop that the uh, early farmers were growing. They also grew uh, barley and wheat and rye and tobacco. But corn was the main one. So uh, in the Long Canes community, the Cunningham family, Robert Cunningham, Patrick Cunningham, William Cunningham. William Cunningham, you may know him best as Bloody Bill Cunningham. But he came from, from right here. Um, Patrick Cunningham captured the shot and powder and um, then sort of hung out here in, in this area. The um, Whigs under General Andrew Williamson, he had a 450-man militia force. You know, he um, was uh, concerned about, you know, Patrick Cunningham. So Andrew Williamson occupied the town of 96 looking for Cunningham, but he wasn't there. In the meantime, the Loyalists raised a force of 1,900 men from the 96th district. And they surrounded William, uh, Andrew Williamson in 96, and that's the first siege of 96. The Council of Safety was worried about that. They um, commissioned Richard Richardson, the colonel of the militia in Camden, to go to 96 to relieve Andrew Williamson. Um, Richard Richardson raised a force of 4,000 men, and he started marching through. Well, they knew that the rescue was coming. They decided to call a truce here with Andrew Williamson's men and the, the loyalists who were surrounding them. And uh, basically, they said everybody go home would be nice to each other. Even though shots had been fired, and, and one man, James Birmingham, was the first uh, South Carolina Patriot killed with this first siege of 96. And um, Richard Paris from Greenville, who, you know, made his place on the uh, falls of the Reedy River, um, he was one of the ones who negotiated that, that treaty. And uh, the two sides split. But Richardson's group coming in did not recognize the terms of the treaty because they weren't there. They had nothing to do with making those terms. And they started rounding up uh, loyalist leaders throughout this area. And they started going after Patrick Cunningham. Well, Patrick Cunningham went to the wildest place that he possibly could imagine to escape from Richard Richardson. And where he went was into the wilds of Cherokee Territory, right here on the banks of the Reedy River, um, at a huge cane break. And this site right now is real close to, if not, the area of the Hopkins Farm on Fort Shells Road. And uh, so that's where Patrick Cunningham sought safety, because in a cane break, this is a traditional um, a defensive spot for the Cherokees. Um, you can't sneak up on somebody in a cane break. The rustling leaves make way too much noise, and so this is a defensive stand for them. Um, and uh, Richardson got word that Cunningham was at uh, the cane break, so he sent a flying column of 1,300 men to this spot to surround uh, Cunningham 
and they almost got away. They almost completely surrounded them, and they captured 130 men, but 70 got away. And the participants that were there at the Battle of the Cambrai were some of the most important people throughout the rest of the Revolutionary War. Uh, and it all started on December 23rd, um, 1775, at the Cambrai. On Richard Richardson's staff, his adjutant was Thomas Sumter. Andrew Pickens was there. Um, General Richard Wynn was there. Thomas Neal was there. These are all individuals that had an important roles in the future uh, battles that were coming in the Revolutionary War. Also, during this time, um, important loyalists were there. One of the loyalists was James Lindley. Uh, he was a Justice of the Peace for 96 uh, Court uh, District. But he was a loyalist because he loved what the British government was doing for him. They gave him 200 acres. They gave him 200 acres that had an old fort on it, a fort from 1758. Um, was on James Lindley's property. And this fort was fortified uh, during this time, but it was by the Patriots because Lindley, he was captured at uh, 96. So he was kind of out of the picture. Jonathan Downs, the uh, major in charge of the Lawrence Militia, it's called Little River Militia at that time, he was a neighbor of James Lindley and he took over that, that fort. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, Fort Lindley in the coming months, of the coming uh, discussions. That's a fort that's only about 25 miles from here that played an important role in the early part of uh, the Revolutionary War. Another individual that was at the Battle of the Cape, Cape, Great Cane Break was a 19 year old sergeant named David Fanning. David Fanning lived where uh, Raven Creek uh, joined the Reedy River, which is now where Lake Greenwood is. David Fanning was the finest man that this area ever produced. He was incredible. He was a loyalist. He was a Tory. He was a big time Tory. Um, he was an orphan in North Carolina. He developed a certain kind of skin condition on the top of his head. It was called skull head. I mean, it was ugly scars up there. It's kind of like ringworm or something like that. He always wore a skull cap. Um, I think he was indentured or something like that to it, or apprenticed to somebody in North Carolina that he didn't like, so he just left. And as a very young man, he started you know, his own life down here in the uh, backcountry of South Carolina. He says at first that he was going to be a, uh, um, a Whig. He believed in what the Whigs did. He was trading with the Indians. He had pack horse with four pack horses loaded down with goods and everything and so forth. And he was waylaid, he was robbed by um, some uh, Whig forces. Captain Ritchie, um, who you know was a notorious fellow. They stole all his goods. They stole the clothes off his back. They stripped him naked. Clothes were a valuable thing back then. The um, settlers would only have like one set of clothes. If you had two or three shirts, you were a rich man. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was something people needed quite a bit. So they stripped um, David Fanning. Uh, Totally nude, he was 40 miles from his home and he walked through the woods and everything and, and finally made it home and he said he decided to be a, um, a loyalist after that. He probably was gonna be a loyalist anyway, who knows. But uh, he, he was captured time after time after time and he escaped time after time after time. He was an escape artist, there's no doubt about it. He was, it was just, I, I could talk for the whole time about David Fanning. He escaped 14 different times. He was imprisoned in 
uh, the jail in Fort at uh, 96 four different times. The first time he was in there, he was in there for treason. Um, the sheriff put him in there for, he was in there for months before the trial came. The people on the jury, it just so happens, they were a bunch of loyalists too, and they found him innocent. So after he'd been in jail for two or three months, he was found innocent um, and sent home. Well, the next day, the sheriff drives up, rides up again with three or four guys and say, hey, guess what? He's like, what? I never said, he said, yeah, but you owe me rent. <laughs> So, and he arrested him again and took him to jail. One of uh, Fanny's friends paid to get him out. He was arrested three other times and thrown in that jail. One of his friends brought him two files. So he took one of the files and saw it to the bars, but the other file he hid. So he um, saw it to the bars and gets out the first time and he's out for a little while. He gets arrested again. He gets thrown back in jail. This is the third time he's in jail. Well, he's got a hidden file. So he goes and gets it. And he saw us through the bars again. So he, he got what? Got, got arrested the fourth time. And this time, that jailer, he was not going to, um, you know, let Fanny get away. I told you it was a three-story jail. They took him up to the attic. And they chained him to a chain. He was chained and all this kind of stuff. And he was chained to a, a bolt in the floor. And he figured out how he could break, you know, one of the locks on the chain. He found the um, weakest link. And he broke that. He was still in handcuffs. You couldn't, there was a trap door, you know, you couldn't open it except from below. The jailers actually realized that he had gotten loose from his bolt in the floor, but they're like, "No, oh, this guy ain't getting nowhere." He went through the chimney. He he knocked bricks out of the chimney and went down the flue, and he got out that way. And it wasn't much longer after that that he did just leave South Carolina. He was tired. <laughs> But he went to North Carolina and he did incredible things. He he had a 900 man uh, militia group of loyalist militia. He was made a colonel. He was given his own jacket with red jacket with black um, trim. You didn't get that back then, you know. Special people. He had 900 people. He captured the governor of North Carolina in Hillsborough. Twice he raided. The state capital, which is a government, which is in Hillsborough. But on the second time, he captured the governor, governor and marched him all the way down to Wilmington, where the British were uh, in North Carolina, fighting the whole way, fighting the whole way. And he delivered that government to that governor to the British. He went on a rampage later. 30 day rampage where he burned 30 homes. Now, you know, burning, if you burned homes, you were pretty much considered a bad guy. Uh, and he was the most wanted man in North Carolina for a long time. But he was the fightingest man uh, that just about, you know, came through um, in the Revolutionary War. He was, he was quite a character. Another character that was at the Great Cane Break, and this is 10 miles from here. But another character fighting for the Whigs was a fellow named William Cunningham. And this is Bloody Bill Cunningham. Bloody Bill Cunningham started the war as a Whig, as a patriot. And the story is, he, he said that um, he would join the Whig forces just as long as he could stay, you know, close to home. He didn't have to travel a lot and stuff like that. And every, all of these militiamen were very concerned about traveling too far from home. They want to stay home where they can plant their crops and take care of their own families and, and that sort of thing. But um, Cunningham's unit was transferred to Charleston. You know, he's like, oh, that's, I didn't sign up for this, you know. And, he was insubordinate to his commanding officer, so the commanding officer tied him to a post and whipped him 50 times. And uh, so he deserted after that. He wasn't going to have any part of that. And he went to um, 
went to Savannah at this time, and he also spent some time in Florida. But at this particular point, he was in Savannah, which is again under British control at this time. Well, that fellow I told you about, William Ritchie, he came and visited with uh, William Cunningham's father and actually wanted to know where Cunningham was. Apparently that was why he was there. And uh, William Cunningham also had an invalid brother and who had epilepsy and probably a number of other problems as well. And they abused the father, they beat the father, they abused the brother, they killed the brother. And William Cunningham found out about that and um, he didn't have a horse at this time. He walked from Savannah, 180 miles away. He walked to William Ritchie's house. And William Ritchie was in there with his wife and his children. And Bloody Bill, you know, busted open the door, got uh, William Ritchie, dragged him out into the yard, and shot him to death right there in front of his family. And that's the first death we have attributed to Bloody Bill Cunningham, even though he went on a murderous rampage in November of 1781. This is a month after Yorktown. We think the war ended with Yorktown. Well, it didn't. Uh, and a month after Cornwallis surrendered, uh, Cunningham took 300 men from Charleston and made a circuit through the back country, uh, killing and murdering as he went. He killed 76 men in like a six week period. And one of his most gruesome um, uh, massacres was at Hayes Station in Lawrence County. Now, part of what we're going to be doing with this series of lectures that I'm giving here is also be going on field trips. Um, and I would like for you folks to participate on the field trips as much as, as possible. You know, these are going to be on Saturdays. The next one is uh, July the 20th. It's a Saturday at 10 o'clock. I want to meet on uh, Knickerbocker Road, which is the site of the Kellett Blockhouse. And then from there, we'll go down to Fort Lindley, 25 miles away. And Kellett Blockhouse and Fort Lindley are closely related. So I really would love to see everybody at the field trip. Um, we're, we are uh, going to explore the area of Andrew Pickens' um, home site and where he did the, uh, the rain fight. We're also going to go to Hayes Station as well. And this is where Bloody Bill Cunningham, um, you know, killed 18 men cold-blooded after they had surrendered. He, he literally hacked them to pieces. And the relatives couldn't tell whose arm belonged to whose head or anything like that. I mean, it was gruesome. And, and these men were buried in a mass grave because there was just no other way to do it. Um, and we'll, we'll go to um, Cowpens or Kings Mountain, depending on what folks might want to do, do the, best, uh, the most. But I'm sort of tonight setting the stage, um, I hope, for the, the different activities that really come when the Revolutionary War heats up. One thing, another point that I really would like for you to, to realize is there are two phases, there are two periods of the Revolutionary War here in South Carolina. The first five years of the war was the American period. And the last two years um, was the British period. And the it fights with the Cherokees primarily deals with the American period. Um, there were some skirmishes with the, uh, between the Loyalist and the uh, Whig forces. The Whigs won every time. There was never a Loyalist victory in South Carolina, Loyalist militia victory in South Carolina. They lost every time. And one of the primary reasons for that is during the Snow Campaign with Richard Richardson, when they arrested all of the uh, loyalist leaders such as Thomas Fletcher, Moses Kirkland, Richard Paris, 
Um, Richard Parrish spent nine months in a dungeon in Charleston in chains. And then he um, sort of was, uh, he left to go down to West Florida at that time. But everything changed on May the 12th, 1780. Now, i am you know, been throwing some dates out and so forth, and it's interesting to know the chronology of how things happened. But the most important date of all to remember during this whole Revolutionary War time here in South Carolina is May the 12th, 1780. And that is the date that Charleston surrendered to Henry Clinton, Sir Henry Clinton, the British uh, commander. When Charleston fell, it changed everything. The um, Whigs were ascendant at that time, but when Charleston fell, in quick succession, uh, 96 became a British outpost. Camden became a British outpost. Georgetown was a British outpost. Augusta was a British outpost. There was a ring all the way around with Charleston as the fulcrum. And in addition, there were uh, other outposts in between these areas. The communication post. Musgrove's Mill was, was right, right in there. We're going to talk about Musgrove's Mill. That was a communication post. Uh, Rocky Mount. Hanging Rock in these two areas. Thomas Sumter attacked them. We had three of the greatest um, military generals in the Revolutionary War that by far outsurpassed any other state. Um, these are militia leaders. And these were Andrew Pickens, Thomas Sumter, and Francis Mary. I mean, these guys, we need to be so proud of them. Um, they turned the tide because it, it was just such devastation um, when, when the British captured um, Charleston and all resistance collapsed to, except for just a minor, minor extent, and then slowly momentum started building back um, to, to the Patriot forces. But, uh, one of the lectures is the next lecture is going to be the Cherokee War of 1776, and that's important. Uh, then we're going to be talking about the British period, and the fourth lecture will be the uh, victories in the field that led to the end of uh, British control in South Carolina and in America. There was more that happened here rather than anywhere other than anywhere else in the country. I was thinking about titling this series of lectures, um, 50 Events Within 50 Miles. I mean, we are right in the center of so much activity that happened. But when I did more research, I realized, oh man, I was way off. I, you know, I can't name it that. But I can name it um, 112 Events in 50 Miles. <laughs> That's, that's what it was. There were 112 incidents, major, major things like Cow Pens and Kings Mountain in 96, but also minor incidents too. Um, but this was the heart of uh, Revolutionary War activity. Let's see. Um, so, you know, those are our different points that I wanted to bring up. I know it's re repetitive for some of some of you folks who were here last time. Um, hope I've been able to add a little bit more detail. But I would like to see if uh, anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer. Yes? When you mentioned um, the Ritz Corner. Yes. Well, that's the West now. Yes, it? yes it is. From where? <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. Due west, due west is not due west of anything. <laughs> when you go, and I, and, hey, I drew, a, I drew a line. When you go due east from due west, you don't hit anything till you get to Spain. <laughs> but that's the thing. Do du, Dewitt's Corner. You say it real fast. What does that come? Dewitt's, 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 Dewitt's. 
That's how it got its name. Due West got its name from a bastardization of the pronunciation of DeWitt's Corner. Was it a trading post? It was a spot on the ground. <laughs> I know it. I know it. And, and actually, Due West is about three miles. I don't know if it's north, east, south, or where. But uh, it's, it's, Due West is three miles removed from DeWitt's Corner. And it probably was a trading post or something like that, but it was just it was just the only point they had. And I'll tell you this about Thomas Neal. He he's the one that um, surrounded Richard Paris's plantation. Richard Paris had a plantation house, a sawmill, a grist mill, a trading store, a whiskey still. He had a fort. The um, Cherokees and loyalists who were run out of their home living in Cherokee land. Um, they dressed as Cherokees, and because they dressed as Cherokees, they were called Scofalites. William Scofal was a fellow, a bandit, who liked to dress as a Cherokee or an Indian, and he would go rob, murder, and kill people and say, oh, the Indians did it. You know, the Indians got blamed for everything. But there were lots of Scofalites and Cherokees here at Richard Paris's plantation, and they left from Paris's plantation to attack Fort Lindley, which we're going to be talking about. Um, so the day that this force of one, one, I got three different accounts on how many people it was. One said 245, one said 200, one said 600. These are eyewitness accounts. Um, <laughs> yeah, <to wonder. laughs> but uh, they were from opposing sides, so there's there's where the discrepancy comes in. So on the day that this group left to attack 96, which is the only offensive action by the Cherokees during the Cherokee War, the rest of the time is defensive, and the rest of the time you're getting tails kicked. But um, Thomas Neal comes from Prince's Fort in Spartanburg, and he attacks and surrounds Paris's place. And there's hardly anybody there but Mrs. Paris and uh, probably some slaves and everything. Paris had 12 slaves. He loaded up three wagon loads of goods from the Paris plantation, and they were very impressed with Mrs. Paris because she had three petticoats. <laughs> I don't think there's hardly anybody else in the back country who had petticoats. And she had three bonnets as well. And they also had a harpsichord. So I mean, they had some fancy stuff there. It was $7,000 worth of goods. And I'm not sure if this included the slaves or not because the slaves were the most valuable property. But uh, they took these goods to Fort Prince and they burned Paris's place completely to the ground. Thomas Neal did that. Thomas Neal had, he was in his 40s. He had twin sons who were in their 20s. Um, one of his sons, both of his sons were, were fine um, militiamen. One, and one of his sons was a colonel. One of those twins was also a colonel. And the other twin, I don't know, I mean, he had a high rank as well. Thomas Neal had a 16-year-old son. 16, he was a lieutenant. So this is quite some family. Thomas Neal's wife, Janet, scout by the Indians. Thomas Neal killed at Stone, where um, when the British attacked in 1780. His youngest son, the colonel, he was killed at Hanging Rock. His other twin son was killed. His 16-year-old son, the lieutenant, was um, serving with Joseph Hayes, who was a Lawrence County militia. And Joseph Hayes, with his 18 men, was having lunch one day when they looked at the surrounding hill and they saw a fire rising from the widow Williams plantation. Her husband, James Williams, was a general who was killed at King's Mountain. 
So when uh, Joseph Hayes and his group sees the plantation burning from one hill to the other, they knew, they had had reports that Bloody Bill was on the rampage, but they did not heed these reports. And the next thing they knew, um, 300 men surrounded the 1800, I mean the 18. And um, young James Neal was, uh, was one of these men. Uh, Blake Bill said, y'all got to surrender. A shot rang out. Hayes had a blockhouse as well. All these major men, they, they had blockhouses. The blockhouse at Hayes Station was made out of logs. It was 30 feet long, 10 feet wide. It had a cedar shingle roof. So a shot did ring out. One of Bloody Men, Bill's men was killed. So shortly thereafter, they threw a flaming ingot onto the cedar shakes and uh, Joseph Hayes' blockhouse starts burning. So they said, okay, we surrender, we surrender, you know, um, we'll be your prisoners. And Bloody Bill says, okay, that's fine. Come on out one at a time, come out backwards. And um, they tied their hands behind their back all 18 men had their hands, and then they took a rope and they tied the 18 together. And um, they said, okay, we're gonna march you back down to Charleston because you're our prisoners. Well, as soon as that last man had the rope tied to him, you know, Bloody Bill's like, ha ha, we got you now. And he took Joseph Hayes and one of General Williams' sons, General Williams had two sons there at Hayes Station. And they uh, attempted to hang these men from a fodder pole. Uh, and they hoisted them up and the pole broke. And Bloody Bill got so enraged, he pulled out his sword and he started hacking and killed Joseph Hayes first. And uh, James Williams' son was second. There was also a younger son, uh, much younger than the brother. There was two um, Williams brothers there. And he says, oh brother, oh brother, you know, what What shall I tell our mother? Because the father had just been killed at Kings Mountain. Now the oldest boy was killed. The youngest boy says, what shall I tell our mother? And Bloody Bill turned to him and says, you'll tell her nothing, you damn rebel suckling. And he ran his sword through that young boy. Uh, and he continued hacking away. He, he hacked until he could hack no longer. He finally gave up. Some men, I said there were 18, there were actually a few more than 18 because there were some men who were saved by Bloody Bill's 300. And one of these men was Jonathan Downs, who was the, the leader of the... Um, Little River Militia, who apparently was very well respected. Uh, Jonathan Downs' life was saved. Jonathan Downs was the commander at Fort Lindley on uh, July 15, 1776. Now, this pay station event happened four years after. But uh, Jonathan Downs was the commander at uh, Fort Lindley, and he successfully defended that attack from 300 Cherokees and 300 Scofflites, or 245, whichever number you want to pick. And um, he successfully defended that. Three weeks later, he joined up with Andrew Williamson and uh, Andrew Pickens. And we're going to talk a lot about Andrew Pickens. During the ring fight, which was one of the bravest activities that there ever was where Andrew Pickens with his 25 men fought off being surrounded by 185 Cherokee warriors. And it was a uh, hour and 15 minute long battle where Andrew Pickens set up his men in two separate rings with the inner ring firing while the outer ring loaded and vice versa, vice versa. For an hour and 15 minutes they fought this off. And Jonathan Downs was one of the rescuers that came 
to uh, save Andrew Pickens' family. And Andrew, uh, Jonathan Downs was one of the few casualties of the ring fight, because there were several wounded, but no deaths. And, uh, but uh, Jonathan Downs got wounded during this uh, uh, fight, and apparently he was holding his hand something like this, because a bullet went through his hand and lodged in his abdomen. And uh, it stayed there for the rest of his life. He did like another 30 years. Um, and, but that was the end of his military exploits. He didn't leave men after that. I think he just hung around. And he was hanging out at Hayes Station when uh, it was surrounded. And his life was spared. But not those other people. Um, so, you know, that's one of the exploits of uh, Bill Cunningham. Any other questions? Well, if there are none, I appreciate your attention. Um, I've enjoyed talking to you. I hope you've enjoyed listening as well. Thank you so much. As always, uh, we learned something. I'm always indebted to all your knowledge. Okay, the next event will be July the 30th at 7 o'clock, and that's going to be the Cherokee War of 1776.